Um, good evening, everybody. Um, you know, first of all, thank you so much for being here and thank you for, for, for hosting us tonight. Um, I'm really always pleased to be able to speak to a different group of people because my background is physics and physics teaching. And so I'm always excited to, to get to know other communities. Um, so that's me. And then Christian. Yeah, um, like Roxanne, Christian Vieira, we're married. That's why we have the same last name. I'm a software developer. I do mostly mobile development, Android and iOS. And uh, I got started in sensors uh, about seven years ago. Rebecca was a high school physics teacher and she wanted students to use uh, sensor data like accelerometer and gyroscope data from their smartphones instead of expensive probware. And I created a set of apps physics toolbox sensor suite that uh, allows students to access the raw data from the sensors and record it and visualize it. And what's super exciting, I think about, um, you know, my background in education, specifically originally teaching high school physics students and then Christian's background um, with the mobile app development, we ended up developing a tool that was really intended for like 125 kids <laughs> of my own, basically. Um, and since then we have more than, I believe now more than 2 million downloads um, and something like 60% uh, of our users are actually not in education. They're in engineering, they're in medicine, they're in um, higher levels of academia and research, um, acousticians. So basically in this presentation, we want to share with you a little bit about um, uh, kind of where we develop things and then where things have gone from there. Um, and then I also do want to recognize we do receive funding from the National Science Foundation. We're very grateful for that. And that's specifically for the development of a fairly complex um, augmented reality app, um, which we'll also be talking a little bit about. So um, I will keep my eyes on the chat as much as I can to see if questions pop up to see if we're able to address them within the context of our presentation. And if not, then we'll definitely be sure to address them afterwards. Um, so basically our objectives for this presentation tonight is really to describe, um, you know, what mobile sensors are, why they might be useful for your own app development. Um, and then second of all, to take a look at exactly what are the operating principles from a physics or electrical engineering standpoint, um, which I'll speak a little bit more to. And then Christian's going to speak more to the, you know, the, the back end side, the programming side. So how do you get access to that data? How do you filter it? Um, how do you make meaning out of it? Because not all data is meaningful, right? So to begin, um, and we can make the slides available for anybody who does want this, so don't worry about screen capture. And then this is also being recorded just so that you are aware. Um, so you can always watch the video again if you so desire. <laughs> so um, when we're talking about mobile devices, we're primarily talking about smartphones. Um, and there's a number of basic sensors that smartphones have. Many tablets also have them, and also some Chromebooks will have them. Um, but basically, there's six main sensors that we're going to take a look at. Um, accelerometer, which measures motion, changes in motion, so it measures um, g-force directly, and then you can also get linear acceleration. There's the barometer, which is an atmospheric pressure sensor, so it's the air pressure surrounding the device. There's the gyroscope, which is circular motion. Light sensor, there's actually multiple types. There's magnetometer, and then um, most will also have a proximity sensor or a proximeter, which is actually, again, another type of light sensor. Then you've got your composite sensors, which is multiple sensors that give inputs, and then there's some kind of a you know, mathematical algorithm or some kind of a treatment to that data. And one example is linear acceleration. If you remember back to your physics days, um, you might remember that number 9.8 meters per second per second or 9.8 meters per second squared. There's many ways to represent acceleration. And this confuses a lot of developers and frankly, just a lot of adults in general um, because there's zero meters per second per second. Some phones will read out 9.8 meters per second per second for objects that are at rest with respect to the earth. And some phones will actually read out something called G-force, which you've probably heard about it, you know, Many of you probably are familiar with it, but you know, roller coasters and all that kind of stuff. Um, you've also got game rotation vector, step counters, step detectors. All those things use accelerometers and possibly also gyroscope to, to some extent. So those are what are your composite sensors. Yeah, and uh, the, the sensors are fairly cheap product. It didn't increase the cost of phones. So a lot of our high-end phones will have all the sensors like barometers, like um, 
light meters and magnetometers. And for instance, this is the TLSM6 DSM is the sensor that we use in the uh, Google Pixel 4 and the OnePlus 7. It's a gyroscope and an accelerometer. And I was curious, how much does this cost? So if I buy at least a thousand units, it comes to $2.50. So it's very cheap material and big companies like Google and Samsung buy millions of these. So it's very, very cheap. And here's, I actually purchased one of them. The actual sensor is right in the center, in the center of the, this is a developer board and that is the sensor, the accelerometer and gyroscope. So they're very, very small, cheap, and they're included in most phones nowadays to help the phones make sense of the world. And I see we have a question about, are these available both in iOS and Android? And, um, and yes, um, when it comes yes. to pretty much every single smartphone, like even your cheapest smartphones, maybe unless you've got some really off brand one, um, is definitely going to have this specific sensor in it, the IMU. Um, it will vary dramatically depending upon the kind of, um, like the, the additional sensors that we're going to talk about. And that's something you can always look up. Um, and with your modern iPhones, of course, those are all consistent across the board, right? So um, yeah, the, there's only one exception. Uh, both Android and iOS have all of these sensors. iOS has the light meter, the one the sensor that detects the light intensity and changes the brightness of your screen. But on iOS, developers don't have access to that sensor. So the sensor is there, but you as a developer don't have access of light sensor in iOS. And so kind of the reason why we wanted to bring up, you know, well, why these things, you know, that the cost, none of us are going to probably go out just buying, you know, <laughs> buying, buying these in bulk or anything. But I think the point we want to make is that um, these sensors are shockingly cheap. They're actually extremely precise, so precise that again, engineers, medical professionals, all different types of people are using these in their everyday work. Um, and so often, I think we forget about the tools that are in our pockets, very literally. And so that's what we try to do is we try to make these accessible. And, and again, it's something that you can consider incorporating with your own apps, potentially. Yeah. Um, I just want to give a couple examples of what are some practical applications. And if you do go to our website, um, maybe Christian can type it in the, the, the chat. Um, we actually have a whole bibliography of all of the um, all of the different citations we have, we get a lot of peer reviewed journals that use our app um, and other apps that are out there. There are other things besides physics toolbox. Um, we specifically developed with the educator in mind, um, but also I think the way that it's very open, it, it can be useful to absolutely anybody. There's a lot of other apps that are much more closed, you know, built into lab experiences and things like that. We didn't want to do that. But um, just as some examples, um, this image right here comes from a um, a, uh, I think it was a doctoral thesis maybe where they were taking a look at infrastructure and they were actually using the accelerometer and looking at vibration. Um, and so they're looking at the structural integrity of the bridge using smartphones. And so the idea is that, you know, if you are an engineer and you want to go out, you want to have a tool in the field, right? And you don't necessarily want to be carrying around a $10,000 specialized piece of equipment, especially if a smartphone works just fine. Another example, um, right here, um, this is uh, in Germany, um, they're trying to do some crowdsourcing. So imagine taking your phone and attaching it to your bike or even just keeping it in the pocket in your pocket as you go on the bike ride and um, you can map out the quality of the roads. Now this is just an example with bikes, but we've also seen it done with transit, like trains in Korea. We've seen it done with, um, with buses and things like that all over the world. And um, take all that data, put it together. It's, it's pretty powerful. And then the last example I have down here is just uh, using a smartphone to, to measure shock absorption in, in the car. So again, smartphones really are giving people an opportunity and a way to, to really rethink um, some of the commercialized um, or, or highly specialized equipment that's needed, that has traditionally been needed in order to do these kinds of things. And then what I love, I always love to think about these really you know, deep human kinds of things too. Um, over here, we've got a group in Mexico that is actually taking a look at how native or traditional housing sustains, um, sustains itself better during earthquakes. And so um, there's been some tests that have been done using, using smartphones, taking a look at vibrations over time. Smartphones um, being attached to people um, for medical purposes. Um, we've seen smartphones being used to, um, to take a look at like a, a stroke recovery. So helping victims to learn how to 
um, mobilize their arms again and try to increase the precision of their motion. We've also seen um, how smartphones have been used to model the motion of people who have specific physical disabilities so that they can redesign tools, like in this case, spoons, um, to help people become more self-sufficient. And then the last and final example I'm going to give, which is what I'm really proud about, is um, there was a nurse, um, there is a nurse, uh, 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 you know, like a research nurse in Australia who actually takes a look at the um, uh, what is it, mortality rates of infants as they are flown from the interior and in more rural parts of Australia to the bigger cities for specialized help. And they've found that not just vibration, but also sound, light intensity, all of these things cause stressors on small children. And um, so they're trying to figure out how to minimize that to increase their, um, uh, their, their um, likelihood of survival. So again, it's really amazing what can be done. And what I'd like to share with you um, uh, is basically you know, how these things work at a super simple level. And some of you, you know, you've probably all heard of microelectromechanical systems. That's really what we're dealing with. This is actually an accelerometer. Um, these are a whole bunch of parallel plate capacitors. And one part of the frame is actually static as the other part moves. And that's what tells us, um, basically, you know, converts motion in some sense into an electrical signal. So there's a whole bunch of great visualizations online that describe how these things work. And so I just want to show really quickly, this is how an accelerometer works in one dimension. Smartphones will have sensors for all three dimensions, X, Y, and Z. And so if you can imagine this, having basically three sets of these, um, the changing capacitance um, between the static and the moving um, uh, bars basically is what gives you the information. Gyroscopes in contrast measure circular motion and for that um, it actually uses two accelerometers and it actually has a forced vibration in one direction and then based upon how the other, um, how the other grading slides around it basically um, takes a look at what we what call the Coriolis effect or the Coriolis um, force. And it'll show a quick visualization here. It's really awesome. I do want to make sure that we that you see this. Let me just see if I can fast forward it a little bit here. Oops. No, I guess not. See, so I'm not sure if it's actually playing or not. Oh, there we go. So in this case, it looks like the forced vibration is um, side to side. That's what we call the driving direction. And then the moment you start rotating, you start to get an apparent effect um, in, in, in um, you know, an apparent, uh, an apparent motion with the other grading, basically. So that's that. We'll show you the magnetometer later. But um, one thing that I do want to share is that um, accelerometers are not like a total panacea, right? Because um, when it comes to understanding where you've gone and where you've been, um, smartphones have a very hard time telling exactly where they are. And so if you were to use an accelerometer for dead reckoning, meaning if you were to take basically acceleration data, integrate it to get change in velocity data and integrate it again in order to get displacement data that tells you where you moved and where you moved from and how far, um, you get a lot of, dr you get a lot of um, drift. And so this is actually an example of the augmented reality app that Christian um, has developed. Um, and you can see that over time, where we've placed some of these vectors actually move away from the ball. And part of that is because dead reckoning is just not very good. And in this particular case, it's because the camera, which we're using to anchor, um, is kind of losing its frame of reference. So that's that. Um, you know, there's plenty that you can do with accelerometers. It's probably the most popular of all of the sensors, just because there's so much information you can get from it. I love using it with students because students have such a hard time understanding acceleration. Um, it's just, it's kind of meta <laughs> for them. Um, gyroscope um, is more understandable for folks. Um, again, this is in three dimensions. So there are three different um, components to the sensor. And instead of taking a look at kind of planar or X, Y, and Z coordinates, it's actually around the X, Y, and Z axes, if that makes sense. And then we've got environmental sensors. Um, We've got uh, ambient temperature, which some smartphones have. That measures not the battery temperature, which almost every phone will give you information for, but external um, ambient temperature is actually the external like outside temperature. Um, it's fairly rare to have these in phones. I'm sure Christian could tell us which phones um, yeah, um, are available in. But. 
Yeah, ambient temperature Galaxy S4 and Galaxy Note 3 had it, and then no other phone has had it. I do have some Qualcomm developer devices, developer preview devices. They do have it, but it's fairly uncommon. Mm -hmm. And then light sensor, as Christian's already mentioned, is not accessible on the iPhone, but it is on Android. There's actually multiple types of light sensors, though. This one right here is in reference to the like kind of black and white environmental light. Um, but your smartphone also has RGB detectors, so red, green, blue specifically. Um, it cannot get spectral data, um, not directly. Um, and then you also have, in many cases, um, you have the camera. iOS will sometimes, when you see an app that says light meter, it might use camera light, um, but that is not very accurate. So we strongly encourage people not to use that. And then some have even things like relative humidity. Um, again, many of these things have phased out because the utility is just really not there. <laughs> it's just not, not, not super helpful. This is our daughter pressing, pressing down on a bag filled with air. Um, you can see the barometric pressure um, increasing as she presses down on it. Um, you know, there's no practical reason why any of you would ever want to do that with a bag of air. Um, this is really helpful for determining altitude and for helping out with things like, you know, geolocation, um, GPS, um, maps that are at multiple heights, such as in a, in a, in a shopping mall or something. The barometer, I think, is really cool because, again, this uses, um, you know, MEMS technology, and in this case, there's a tiny little, um, tiny little uh, box of air, basically, and then there is this um, grid that sits on top of it, a resistive grid, and basically, as pressure, as the external air presses down on it and changes or deforms that surface, um, it changes the resistance of that grid and then, therefore, gets converted into an electrical signal. So that's the barometer. And now I'm gonna hand it over to Christian, who's gonna kind of take us a little bit more through some of the back end, and we'll use pressure sensor as a specific example of that before we go back to me, so. Yeah, perfect, so before we use any of the sensors in Android, we need to check if they exist, because if we make a call to the sensor and the sensor is not there in the device, we're gonna get a null pointer exception, right, a crash. So for that, um, I use a package manager class, and I can check, uh, create a barom variable and package manager dot feature sensor. And in this case, the barometer, it's calling the system pressure. So if that variable returns, becomes true, it means there's a sensor. And if not, you want to uh, filter out, right? You want to um, have a different path in your app, perhaps don't show the data. Um, you can also tell us filtering using the app. Um, you know, using your own app. This is filtering via Google Play. If you go to Google Play, you can also add in your manifest class, which sensor, and you can filter out that the app won't be installable via the Play Store if that sensor is not present in your device. So if your app requires a barometer 100%, you don't uh, allow the user to install the app. And here's a small example of how we get the data actually from the sensor and have a couple of variables, sensor manager, that contains, um, manages all of the sensor data, all of the many sensors that can exist in your uh, system. And I create a simple variable pressure that will contain a reference to the barometer, which we call pressure sensor. And on my create uh, function, I uh, assign the sensor manager to get system service, I get the context for that. And then on my pressure sensor variable, I assign I use sensor manager, get default sensor, and I use the sensor type pressure barometer and assign it to my uh, barometer to start uh, in the process of getting the callbacks. And um, as a part of my coding style, I always uh, register the listener and with the listener, when, when we register the listener, we start getting the callbacks uh, of the sensor events, and I always register on the on resume, and on the on pause, I always unregister the sensor, uh, the listener, because this listener is very uh, battery intensive, and you get multiple callbacks constantly. So if your user leaves the app, you want to, or the activity or fragment, you want to unregister that to release uh, resources. And. Uh, the final step into getting the data um, from a sensor on Android is that we have to implement into our class sensor event listener. So we're doing an implementation of sensor event listener class. 
And when we do that, we have to add, uh, Android Studio will tell you, you need to add two uh, methods. And one of them is on accuracy change, which will let you know if the accuracy of the sensor changed, something's going wrong. So you can deal with that. And uh, on sensor change, on sensor change is where you get the actual sensor data. Uh, for instance, here I have the variable barometric pressure equals event dot values into position zero because there's only one element in that array, which is the barometer. But for some other sensors, like the accelerometer, gyroscope, and magnetometer, those sensors have X, Y, and Z components. So you will get event values in position zero, one, two, and so on. And uh, just one final point into the on sensor change. Uh, you want to do as little as possible on this function because these might be called up to 500 times per second for some sensors like the accelerometer. So you don't want to put your logic in that uh, function. You want to just get the data from there and then process it somewhere else in your app. Um, going back to the on accuracy change that I mentioned before, on some sensors, uh, the data quality might degrade over time. Some, and the system will alert you. On my apps, I usually just, uh, don't notify the user if the accuracy is high or medium. But if it's low and unreliable, you can add code uh, into your function to maybe warn the user to take some, do some calibration or restart the process. And um, I me mentioned it passingly, when you create the listener to the sensor, you have to select uh, delay. And Android has this very, on intuitive way to specify the delay, you can select fastest game, normal, and UI. And those things don't really mean a lot to me. Fastest makes a little bit of sense. You will get the sensor data as soon as it is available to the system. So that's the most highest battery consumption and they go in, you know, one, two, three, four. Delay UI is the slowest and that's the one that you would use just to detect if you're using your phone and changing from landscape to portrait, or portrait to landscape. It's very slow. You'll get very few samples per second, but it's very battery friendly. And I compiled this list about a year ago, so I don't have the newest phones like the Galaxy S20 there, but these are the maximum sample rates that you can get from the sensor, sensors like the accelerometer. It usually maxes out at 400, 500 on some unusual examples. Barometer is, uh, slower sensor, so you won't get as many samples per second. Uh, gyroscope, gyroscope and accelerometer are often the same and have, are often housed in the same unit, the IMU, so they'll have essentially the same frequency in most cases. And magnetometer is usually between 50 and 100 hertz uh, sample rate. On, um, the sample rate on Android specifically, because on iOS I don't struggle with this, and Android is slightly inconsistent. So like the frequencies that I showed before, they're average, but they're not constant. So Android is not a real time operating system. And there's so many processes uh, working in the background and the operating system gets the data and then only makes it available to you at some point. So timestamp between when that event happened and when you actually get it on Android might be a hundred milliseconds off. And I have this little GIF of my app showing how the sensor collection rate is like 417, 416, so it's a bit unstable. It's generally, it's generally unstable at the highest frequency and it's generally unstable by a couple hertz, hertz so it's not massively unstable. But if you as a user want to get, you're saying, oh, 400 hertz of sample rate on my accelerometer is not enough, there's an option. Highly undocumented, but a couple of years ago, Google added a new class called Sensor Direct Channel, where you can get access to the sensor at an even more raw level. Uh, you can get access, for instance, I tried it on a Pixel 2, and uh, on average on a Pixel 2, I can get 400 samples per second. Using this, I get about 1,700 samples per second. It is highly undocumented. You'll you won't find any good examples there, not even Google's uh, on how to use it. So you have to just do a bit of try or you can reach out to me. Um, data is possibly noisier and in my experience, it's noisier and the battery usage is significantly higher. But if you have some use cases scenario that you need 
really fast data for only a short period of time, that's a path. So there's a number of other different sensors. Um, as, as we mentioned earlier, this is the, the light meter. Um, and again, this is the ambient light meter. So it's a specific, um, specific sensor. On this one, you can actually see it right here. It's almost always near the top. Um, and uh, one thing that I think is uh, you know, notable is you can't always see where it is because there's a lot of phones now where it's actually, um, you know, it's underlaid, it's, it's underneath the, the, uh, the, the screen, basically. So um, the, the screen actually, um, the, the light sensor basically works through it, which I think is pretty awesome. Um, then you've got your position sensors. Um, we've got magnetic or the magnetometer and also proximity. Um, the magnetometer one is considered a position sensor because of its utility with things like Google Maps, um, so ge geolocation stuff, right? So the compass basically. Um, that also is three dimensional, um, is measured in micro Teslas. And then most phones also have proximity sensor, um, which is again, somewhere up near the top and typically that's actually, um, it's actually got two little components to it. It has a little infrared light beam, so you won't be able to see it. And it basically is looking for reflected infrared light. So there's, there's a, a, next to it, there's another little like a, um, LED that's looking for that um, reflection. And that's what turns your screen off when you hold the phone next to your ear while you're making a phone call. Um, in our particular case, um, we uh, like the magnetometer for the compass components, but um, also because it allows us to do a lot of a lot of scientific things with magnetic fields. Um, this here is uh, an example of the Oersted effect. So we've got a direct current going through um, a, a wire there, and you can see that it produces a magnetic field. But this can be used for for a lot of different applications, including um, what we showed you earlier with the little blue ball, which was plotting magnetic field. Um, again, I've got another little video for you that will show you how the magnetometer works. Um, smartphones will have one of two different um, approaches to this. The first one is the Hall effect, where you have some kind of a conducting material, and then when a magnetic field comes in, uh, near it, it basically diverts um, the flow of electrons, and then that can be measured um, with a difference in potential and then converted into, into um, you know, the, the concept of, of how, much, how strong a magnetic field is in the presence of that material. And then some phones will also use the magnetoresistive effect, which basically makes use of um, some kind of a ferromagnetic material and the resistance of that simply changes when it is in the presence of another magnetic field. So within your phone, you'll actually find um, uh, that there may be up to um, two different magnetic detectors um, on your phone. You'll probably have one which is used for the for the compass, the geolocation thing. Um, some will also have one on the side of the screen. Um, I think they're becoming less and less common, but um, you might notice if you bring a magnet close to your phone, it turns the screen off and it might freak you out a little bit. Um, the reason that it turns the screen off um, is actually a couple of different reasons. One of them is that some phones are developed so that when you have a magnetic case that closes it, it turns the screen off. That's the most likely scenario. Um, a lot of people are concerned that it's going to wipe the memory. Um, it doesn't work like that anymore. That was a, a concern back in the old, old days when we were dealing with uh, you know, the big tube, uh, tube TVs and all that kind of stuff. Um, nowadays, it's really, magnets are not a concern. We do lots of stuff with uh, pretty strong magnets. And then for the proximity sensor, you might not think that there's a lot of value there. Um, in my case, again, because my background is education, we do a lot with pendula. And so you can imagine having some kind of a, a material, some kind of an object swinging in front of the proximity sensor and getting some really good time readings. Um, there's a few different things, a few different other things you can do. Most of them are educational applications, but it's something to consider. Um, Christian also did remind me that some phones not only will give you a blocked and unblocked um, kind of a readout, some phones will actually give you a distance reading within a span of a few centimeters. That's not something we've had a chance to play with because we haven't really found value in that, but it's something to consider. Then many of us forget that the microphone itself is a sensor and it is probably, it is an incredibly powerful sensor. Um, this is just an example of uh, one of our apps on the left where Christian is playing different waveforms, different frequencies. And then we have another phone that can detect that, can determine the pitch. So basically you can get the wavelength, the frequency. We can also do things like um, oscilloscope. We can take a look at the addition of waves, um, beats, all different kinds of um, phenomena. 
but there's also um, the possibility to do lots of, you know, pretty, pretty awesome um, analysis with FFT, um, uh, what do they call it, um, waterfall displays. So there's some pretty, pretty awesome visualizations and we find that acousticians really like our app. In terms of how that sensor works, it actually works very similar, it's similarly to the pressure sensor, except in this case, you don't have a fully encapsulated cavity. Um, in this case, what you're dealing with is kind of an open chamber that's looking for, for sound beats, basically, right, for, um, for pulses. And this is just an example of some of the visualizations you can get with the FFT. Um, and for those of you who like music, I always get a kick out of um, listening to the, you know, seeing how different timbers are, are visualized and seeing the various harmonics. Um, so the bass frequency and then any harmonics that might be there. There's a number of non-standard sensors. Um, I already mentioned ambient temperature. That one's pretty rare. Hygrometer, um, uh, hard to find nowadays. And then you'll have some phones that also have things like UV sensors, um, heart rate monitor, and Christian will talk a little yeah. bit about that. So yes, the Galaxy Note 4, Galaxy Note 4 has a UV monitor. So you could grab your phone and point the back of your phone towards the sun and it would give you the UV reading between, I think, zero to seven. Um, again, it was Samsung and it never picked up because that was the only device that had it. I think Samsung tried it, nobody used it, removed it. Uh, so some of those sensors, usually on Samsung devices, are undocumented. And if they are documented, they require including the prop proprietary SDKs. And Samsung has one, you have to register, and it adds to your app four or five megabytes at the minimum of size of the binary. And you're dependent on Samsung to update it and keep it up to date. So. Here's an example, uh, I have a Galaxy S4 and I have a humidifier, uh, one of those unusual sensors, and you can see the humidifier is picking up the value. Also, fun fact, some of our newer phones like Pixel devices and Samsung devices, if you get the device wet near the uh, charging port, you'll get a little notification that the charging port is wet and the device won't charge. So devices are, uh, have multiple sensors that are not open to developers like us, but they're there. Uh, here's another one. This is a Galaxy Note 9 and my daughter, Galaxy Note, uh, and all, I think most Samsung dev devices until the S20 had a heart rate monitor in the back near the, uh, the flash. So here's my daughter putting the, her finger and you can get your heart rate. You can get your blood oxygenation level, SpO2 from the device. And again, to access those sensors, you need to get the Samsung SDK and be an approved vendor. And then the, um, I wanted to share with you also, this is a, the big project we're working on, uh, funded by the National Science Foundation. Um, this is called Magna AR, um, which is also in, in, inside of our flagship, flagship app, which is called Physics Toolbox. Um, basically what we've got here, this is inside of a physics laboratory, not a, not a very complicated setup. We just have a straight bar, we have a simple bar magnet. And then what we have is uh, the field, a magnetic field plotted around it. You can see there's different colors of arrows. I've got some better pictures here. This is a slightly different visualization, um, but what's basically happening here is we ended up working um, with something called um, Google AR Core, which is kind of that, um, you know, the, 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 the software framework that's now available in most phones. iOS also has um, AR Kit, um, which works similarly. And basically what it does is it takes data from the accelerometer, from the gyroscope, and it links it to the camera. The camera uses um, basically visual cues like edges, high contrast um, items, and then also perspective in order to get a sense of place. And so now you're able to anchor the phone positionally to a particular spot and do that dead reckoning and kind of continue to correct for it based upon all these other inputs. Well, what we did for this NSF grant, or rather what Christian, what Christian ended up doing was he ended up taking the magnet magnetometer and then linking that data to the position where the phone is. And as I go around this bar magnet with my, um, as I click basically, it places a vector that represents the relative strength of the field as well as the direction of the field. And now it's got a three dimensional element, um, which you know is better than you know pouring iron filings over a piece of paper on top of a magnet. So for educational perspective, I think it's pretty awesome. Um, and you know we're we're always looking for ways that this might be helpful in the long term. 
So we have a lot of geophysicists who, 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 who use our app, um, not so much for this purpose, but um, we do know that the magnetometer has got some high potential. So this, the image on the left is what you would see in a traditional, typical physics textbook. Um, and uh, we're adding a three dimensionality to it, which I think is, is lots of fun. This is just a um, better visualization of the bar magnet. And you can see you can get a lot of data out of this. And um, traditionally, you know, physicists have been very, and educators have been so reliant upon computational simulations for fields. Um, I think real fields are so much more exciting. So that's, that's where our work is right now. And this is just another example of a um, strong magnet inside of a stereo speaker. Yeah, and um, talk, when we deal with all of this data, all the data can be very noisy uh, when you're, especially when you're mixing data, accelerometer, gyroscope, magnetometer. So they can be noisy, can have offsets, can be offset a little bit to the right on one axis, to the left on another axis. So some sensors need frequent calibration and a great example of that is the magnetometer. The magnetometer sensor can become, uh, the phone actually, can become magnetized. And uh, for instance, here's one of my apps and I show the user your device appears to be magnetized and I give them feedback. So uh, you have to take that into account. Sometimes you have to calibrate the sensor for the user. I, if you ever used an uh, Nintendo Wii that had those controllers, hand controllers, sometimes you would be playing the games and it would ask you, oh, you need to lay them on the ground, leave them there for a few seconds and it would calibrate to try to balance. And that's what you need to do. Here's an example of noisy data. This is the raw data coming from the sensors. Uh, this is an accelerometer X uh, and Y axis. You can see the little peaks. In the greater scale of things, it's, it's very close to zero, but still very noisy. So. To deal with that, I, uh, we can apply uh, filters like uh, moving average, a low pass filter. Is a, moving average is your easiest uh, filter. Just grab uh, an array of data. Maybe you want five points, maybe you want 10 points, and then you average it and divide it by the total. And then you just display that data. Instead of displaying 10 data points, you display one. You can you get a better uh, better, less noisy data, you can do a low pass or a high pass by the frequencies you are filtering certain frequencies. Those are fancier and have more unique uh, use cases. And here's an example, filter off, filter on. The data, this is just a moving average and the, the data looks almost perfect with just a simple moving average filter. Um, Google provides some fancier uh, APIs if you're, uh, if you don't want to just deal with the raw data, if you don't want to calculate things just using accelerometers, gyroscopes, and magnetometers, Google has some very cool APIs that recognize user activity. So you can recognize if a user enter a vehicle, is on a bicycle, is walking, is running, the user is standing still, the user is tilting, um, or if the user is simply walking. So you can detect all of those things with the activity recognition API. And uh, here's just a short example of how to use that API. You have to subscribe to the event. Uh, it's an array list and you get the list of all the possible uh, activities. So in this sense, I'm subscribing to get uh, walking. I wanna know when the user walks and I can uh, set, a, set the activity transition to detect when the user starts walking. So I get the callback that the user started walking at this point. And if I have like a walk pedometer app or something, I can launch a notification, give the user, tell the user, oh, you're starting your walk at this time. And to exit, we can also detect when the user stops doing that, um, that activity. So we can know when the user stopped walking and we just subscribe again to the exit event and we know when that event ended. Uh, also, we have broadcast receivers, and here you can register all of them. If you want to listen to multiple sensors, you get the multiple uh, uh, cases of walking, running, stepping. It's just a different way of accessing all of that data. And the final type of sensor that, I mean, the final main type of sensor that our phones have are location. How we calculate location through GPS. So we have a passive way to get GPS data. We can get GPS via the sensor, raw data, or we can get network uh, location 
using uh, network signals triangulate your location. Uh, the first uh, type is passive location. This is the most battery friendly way to get uh, location data because GPS is one, if not the most battery intensive uh, sensor. So when you're launching Google Maps, for instance, and you're running it in your car, you'll notice your phone gets warm very, very quickly and the battery drains very quickly. It's just a very heavy sensor. It gets, but the most battery friendly way to get the data is uh, passive and you get the location when another app requests it. So if Google Map requested the location, you get that data point. But the problem with that is that you are depending on some other app requesting that data and getting it. So you don't know when you're gonna get it and you don't know what type of data you're getting. You could get the raw GPS uh, locations that will be very, very precise, or you can get a network provided location that can just generally triangulate your location, but it won't pinpoint exactly where you are. And here, the other one is a raw GPS, and this is my app and how, if you're indoors, GPS might not work at all or might take a very long time to get a lock. You in generally need a line of sight to the sky uh, to get uh, the satellite data. And like I mentioned, it's slow to get data. And it's not very battery friendly. But the ideal way, the way that Google recommends for us to get the location is uh, using network on um, Fuse. Fuse location, which is combining network location, this, maybe Wi-Fi, Bluetooth signals, and GPS. And, but to use that, you need to use Google Play services. Um, it might not work outside of, uh, might not work in China at all. So you can get very fast readouts of that, um, but it's a black box. You don't know where this data is coming from or how it was obtained. Was it GPS? Was it network? How recently was this data calculated? Could be five minutes ago, could be a minute ago. You don't know. And you don't know what were the factors that Google decided to, to say that this was the location of the user at that point. And uh, just as a fun fact, our phones, like uh, recent Qualcomm phones, uh, Snapdragon devices, can actually get a combination of sensor, uh, GPS data using GPS, which is Navstar, the American satellite system constellation, GLONASS, which is the Russian constellation, Galileo, the European constellation, and Beidou, the Chinese constellation. So actually when you get a GPS readout, it's a combination, whatever data points are, whatever uh, constellation, you get better readout at that point in time is what the data you get. And here's just a little small function, a uh, small class to get the data so to distinguish between the different constellation data you can get in your app. So you can show like you're getting this GPS data from a Russian satellite, from a Chinese, European satellite. And finally, uh, you can, in a sense, in essence, the ideal way to test all of this is in your personal device. So your device has all of the sensors, so you can test it there. But you can also use the emulator. The tooling on Android Studio is getting better every version. And since I think 3.0, Android 3.0, there's emulator. The emulator, you can fake the data. The emulator uh, here, flipping the device and the accelerometer and gyroscope are reacting. This is my app and they are reacting to the data that I'm feeding. And you can feed for all the sensors, even unusual sensors, you know, less common sensors like the barometer. And here I go and I go into Android Studio and the emulator tools and I can change the parametric pressure. So you can try that if you don't have a device with all the sensors that you need. Great. Well, with that, I think we've covered um, almost all the sensors, certainly not all of them. Um, I see some people are asking questions about things like Wi-Fi strength, you know, and absolutely um, Bluetooth, all these different kinds of things. So there's certainly more things, but I mean, hopefully this gives you a little bit of a starting point um, or maybe expands your mind a little bit about how you might use sensors and, and access them for, for, your, for your apps. So, with that, is it okay if we take questions now? Yeah, and just a quick heads up. The QR code there is for my GitHub account. You can see the AR apps in iOS and Android. You can get the code from there. Uh, how I use the 
magnetometer data in this case and overlay it in augmented reality using AR core and AR key. So you can use the, um, and I guess I can address Hurry Hurriyet's question. Are there sensors or mobile device capability to scan Wi-Fi strength from routers? Yes, there is. If you download Physics Toolbox Sensor Suite free on the App Store, just go and scroll down to the Wi-Fi option and it's there. Basically, you are, uh, how I calculate the Wi-Fi strength signal is just using the something called RSSI ratio. It's a noise to, to signal ratio and it's in negative, in decibels, negative, decibel, negative scale. So the larger values you get, the better, the stronger the signal is, and you, you can definitely get it. That's how you calculate how far away you are from a, a router. I have played with the idea of to, using the AR tools, visualize the strength of my router. I use the Google Nest routers and see how it, the signal will decrease, uh, you know, and what kind of decrease the signal will have. Fun fact, you can also use it on Bluetooth. I've been recently working on Bluetooth and that's how else on Bluetooth you detect how far away you are. Uh, we know with these contact tracing apps that you know some countries are using that you install into your phone and it's using the Bluetooth signals. It's using the RSSI, the signal strength ratio to know how close away you are from other devices to, to measure your, the chances of exposure to COVID-19. Um, let's oh, see, it's, it's EMF. EMF. Oh, electromagnetic frequency? Yes, I do believe that's what he's talking about. Harm. Can you address that one, Rebecca? Um, I mean, so, so electromagnetic frequency, right? So even your, your Wi-Fi, I mean, I guess it, it depends on what you're talking about, right? So um, is there, if there's any harm from the router. So that's a question that goes beyond what smartphones can measure, right? So um, your smartphone's capable of measuring visible light, which is a form of radiation, measure um, infrared light, which is also a form of radiation, um, and, uh, and then Wi-Fi, which is also a form of radiation, right? I don't know if those are microwaves or radio waves. None of those are ionizing radiation. So um, my understanding is that there's really no evidence of anything other than ionizing radiation, which would be things like, um, I guess, ultraviolet, X-rays, and gamma rays. Um, there's no evidence that that has any significant impact um, on people, cancer rates, or anything like that. And that's based on at least the past decade or two of evidence. Yeah, plus the signal drops massively uh, mm -hmm. the farther you are. So yeah. super strong here, enough. barely, you know, it drops massively. But yes, I, anecdotally, I, I might have slept for a long time on, I might have had a Google Nest uh, router underneath my bed. Yeah, we're not concerned. Um, we do have no. a question. We have a question from um, J. Rao. Um, as a, a web GIS professional, how do these sensors connect or relate to GIS? Can you address that, Christian? Uh, GIS, is that like, I want to think it's like global geographic information systems. Um, well, I mean, if you're talking geographic, you can map magnetic field theory, right? You can map magnetic field intensity. You can map, you can use the sensors to crowdsource and map uh, barometric pressure, right? As you, perhaps you map a whole city as a storm is rolling in and you can see an overview of time of your users of the parametric pressure dropping or increasing, depending. Let's see, I don't think I missed anything else. I saw also Jira had a question about learning Flutter, trying to build apps for both iOS and Android in one code base. I don't know if you have any guidance about yeah. that. I know you have some opinions. I, I, I've been very bullish on Flutter, but nothing has happened. I have been unable to have any meaningful products on Flutter because I'm very much caring to, a lot of what I do researchers or high schoolers or college students use. So I want to get as much possible data from the sensor and as raw as possible. So there are options for Flutter. And a while ago, I was uh, I saw that there are some uh, uh, packages, dark packages uh, in Flutter pub, I think it's called the website. Uh, and they're maintained by Google, some of them to get acce accelerometer and gyroscope data. Um, but in general, you don't get as fast of a frequency, but you might not need it. And yes, I tested the one that Google supports for accelerometer and gyroscope, and I could get data on 
Android and iOS. And, you know, it, it might work for your purposes. Do we have any other questions? And I also see Vineeth has said that if anybody wants to ask the question verbally, just let us know. Great. Thank you for your compliments. It's very nice of you. <laughs> yeah, thank you to Jared. He, I actually uh, volunteer and Jared took me up on my work that I would uh, do a presentation at Android DC, which is great because I had attended many meetings and I always wanted to do one. But, you know, I, I wanted to find a good topic and I think this topic with my wife worked very well. Um, question from Jared, can you give us a real world, give us a real world apps that utilize mobile sensors? Um, yes. I, I, I don't actually know what that, uh, Christian, do you know what that Real is? world apps? Well, I mean, uh, okay, just the Android operating system. Every time that I'm rotating my screen, well, you know, it's, this is not a good example, but when you rotate your screen, that's accelerometer that's been in use. Uh, Google Maps uses the GPS and also the magnetometer, the compass. Because sometimes you're using uh, Google Maps and you'll see that it will give you a little like a warning, like your compass needs calibration and you, it asks you to do this little motion. Um, and apps, uh, again, another part, not an app, but again, the operating system, the light meter, mm -hmm. when the brightness changes in your, uh, in your environment, the, the screen, when you're outside, if you have it set to automatically change, it will go super bright outside and it would go very dark inside. Um, I would love to think I, our apps are real world, <laughs> but you know, yes, I like um, the but I mean, but, I mean, but in terms of like, what is with the intentionality, all those things Christian has, has mentioned. And then, you know, it seems like the, the engineers have thrown in a few extras just to see what people would do. But, yeah, and like the barometer, the barometer is an initial sensor that you wouldn't, right. It has useful cases for us in physics, but why, what use does the barometer have for you? Some apps use it, like Dark Sky app uses it for their crowdsourcing of barometric pressure environment, right? Is a storm rolling in or not? Um, but uh, the barometer is also there in our devices to work in conjunction with the GPS. Mm -hmm. So you can calculate your altitude indoors, because I mentioned before the GPS doesn't work indoors, so you can calculate your altitude. You can know how many steps, floors have you gone up, how many floors have you gone down. Okay. Um. We have a question from Jared. Um, let's see, how do you support all the different Android devices that have different sensors from different vendors with different refresh and accuracy rates? Well, uh, we have lots of phones at our house. I think we have like 20. Yes, uh, <laughs> I, uh, I might have, and this is just my workstation for this afternoon. I might have quite a bunch just here that I'm working on. So unfortunately, yes, they're all highly inconsistent and there's bugs and weird things and all. So I have some. Well, I can call it out here, some Huawei devices that uh, I have had to purchase because I get no point or exceptions where I shouldn't, there's no way I shouldn't, but somehow I do. So I have to, I have a lot of devices that I support. Anyway. So if, fun fact, if anybody in the community, local DC community, once like all of this COVID thing goes down, uh, disappears, I can lend you a phone. If you have a crash in <laughs> unique to a certain device, I probably have that phone. Mm -hmm. A uh, question from Chupa, um, how and why does a figure eight motion recalibrate your smartphone's compass? Um, we actually have a blog entry about that, I do believe. If you go to our website, verasoftware.net, um, it, I'm not 100% certain, but I think it, what it does is it actually recalibrates it against the Earth's magnetic field. So it's not just a simple figure eight, it's actually a three-dimensional figure eight. So it kind of goes, you've got to do it like this. And I think what it's doing is, is basically looking at kind of the 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 per perturbations, I guess, in the field based upon or changing orientation, and then tries to calibrate it against, I don't know, a known quantity. I'm not sure. Um, I'm not 100% certain. That's a terrible answer. There's a lot we don't know about magnetism, and that's not well documented, honestly. So. Um, Christian, maybe you can yeah. find that blog and post it in the chat real quick. If, yes, um, yes. Um, some sensors like the magnetometer. Um, we're getting the data, but each sensor, like each sensor unit, it's like its own little computer, right? It has a little, tiny little processor, a bit of memory buffer, and it's doing even some calibration and filtering. Mm -hmm. 
even there. So um, it's a bit of a black box, box but it does work uh, to figure yeah. it. And I'll link to it. Well, and I guess moving through a magnetic field, right, causes induces a current. So my guess is there's something going on there. I don't know. Um, Vineeth asks, uh, do you recommend a place where you can buy these sensors or scavenge it from old devices? Uh, well, scavenging from old devices, it won't work. Uh, my daughter is a Girl Scout and she had like a batch where we disassemble a phone. I had an old phone and we just disassemble it. I tried to even just get the processor, which is one of the biggest uh, chips. And unless you're gonna use like a um, heat gun and carefully pop it from the it all gets ripped uh, up, yeah. It will get ripped up, so not really, but you can buy them very cheaply. Uh, you can try, I, I got a few sensors, uh, like the one that I show with the uh, quarter. Uh, you can just look for the sensor name that you want. A lot of vendors don't wanna sell it to you because like I showed, you need to buy like a thousand for them to make money, but they will give you free samples. I have gotten free samples and you can just ask for them. You'll get it and you can put it on your board and try it out things there. Great. I don't see any additional questions. Um, you can always write to us at support at vrsoftware.net that goes to Christian um, and then Christian forwards it to me sometimes <laughs> depending upon the type of question. Um, the slides, uh, Christian can you actually post the link the view only link to the slides? Uh, yeah and I can I can share it. I'll share it yeah. right now and I can uh, we, I'm sure we can we can post it. Uh, if you follow us on Twitter or send me an email, I'll gladly post it. Uh, and there. if, 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 uh, yeah, you can also post it in the description on YouTube too, if you want to go straight to the slides. That's totally Just like fine. 10 more seconds and I'll get the link. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much. Um, we've really appreciated having the opportunity to talk with all of you. And um, looks like Christian just shared the slides there. Um, so we hope you found it useful. And, um, and if so, please do write to us. We love to interact with, with other people working on the same things that we're also passionate about. So yes. great.